Hi, I'm Richard Sedlock, and welcome to the Green Ninja course on climate science. This is episode 7, in which we'll investigate Earth's atmosphere, its composition, its structure, and its interaction with solar radiation that ultimately makes life on Earth possible. You probably already know that air, Earth's atmosphere, consists almost completely of nitrogen and oxygen in ratios of 78% to 21%. The other 1% or so consists of dozens of gases, the most common of which are listed here by their chemical symbol. Carbon dioxide, neon, helium, methane, krypton, hydrogen, nitrous oxide, xenon, and ozone. The atmosphere also contains 0 to 4% water vapor, but we ignore it because water molecules come and go so freely in the atmosphere. Depending on the weather, the average residence time of a molecule of water in the atmosphere is just 8 to 10 days. Scientists recognize several layers in the atmosphere as shown in this diagram. However, the only ones that really matter for us are the two that are closest to the planet's surface, the troposphere and the overlying stratosphere. The stratosphere is the home of the ozone layer that protects life on Earth from destructive ultraviolet radiation. Without that protection, Earth would be sterilized of over 99% of its life, including humans. Well, surprise, humans managed to screw up this protective sheath, starting in about 1950 with synthesized chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, and then used them in styrofoam, spray cans, refrigerants, and lots of other products. As a result, lots of killer chlorine atoms floated up to the stratosphere and destroyed ozone atoms. The effect was strongest near the South Pole, where two-thirds of the ozone was lost. At the latitude of the Bay Area, about 4% was lost. But even that could have been enough to increase skin cancers, cataracts, and other health problems. And those issues would have worsened if the trend had continued. Fortunately, scientists recognized the problem fairly early and conveyed the matter to the public. Politicians got the message and managed to cooperate internationally to ban the production and use of CFCs. The ozone layer appears to be recovering, slowly. The troposphere is where humans live, fly, experience weather, mountain climb, you name it. Almost 80% of the atmosphere's mass is in this layer that's only about 7 miles or 12 kilometers thick. One cool attribute of the troposphere, the temperature incre decreases about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit for every 1,000 feet of elevation gain. So when it's 30 degrees Fahrenheit and snowing on Mount Hamilton, with an elevation of about 4,200 feet, it's 44 degrees Fahrenheit and drizzling in nearby downtown San Jose, which has an elevation of only 100 feet. This diagram schematically shows how far radiation of various wavelengths is able to penetrate Earth's atmosphere. Visible light, some infrared, and some ultraviolet get through in the optical window, and radio and some microwaves get through in the radio window. Complex life forms were able to develop on Earth only because the atmosphere reflects or absorbs gamma rays, x-rays, and most ultraviolet radiation. Our star, the Sun, radiates energy at a variety of wavelengths. About 49% of it's at infrared wavelengths, about 49% at the visible light wavelengths, and about 2% at ultraviolet. Neglig negligible amounts are emitted at the other wavelengths. Now, if you need a reminder, at the upper right is the spectrum of radiation types. From our perspective here on Earth, we call the incoming solar radiation insulation, which is a portmanteau. A portmanteau is a word that combines parts of other words, like smog is a combination of smoke and fog. In this case, it's incoming, technically incident, solar radiation, so insulation. As we've seen, some of the insulation doesn't make it through the atmosphere. Most of the inf insulation does make it through, though, and, and the Earth absorbs much of it thereby increasing its own energy level. Earth then radiates its sun-delivered energy strictly at infrared wavelengths. 
In comparison, remember that over 50% of solar radiation is at shorter wavelengths, visible in UV. Well, most atmospheric gas molecules on Earth are oblivious to the passage of the longer wavelength radiation from Earth, just as they are to the shorter wavelength solar radiation. However, molecules of certain gases, called greenhouse gases, absorb part of Earth's infrared radiation that otherwise would pass out into space. As we'll see, this is the key to not just Earth's climate, but also to life on Earth. If Earth was a black body, in other words, if it emitted exactly as much total energy as it absorbed from insulation, its average surface temperature would be minus 18 degrees centigrade, which is zero degrees Fahrenheit. This calculation is based on basic physics, like certain laws that I mentioned in episode five. But Earth's average temperature is much warmer. It's a balmy 15 degrees C or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Why? Well, remember the greenhouse gases, or GHGs, that we talked about a couple of slides ago? Molecules of these gases absorb some of the infrared radiation emitted by Earth that otherwise would be lost into space. The greenhouse gases effectively trap radiation in the atmosphere, raising the average temperature. Without this greenhouse effect, life as we know it would be impossible. By the way, the phrase greenhouse effect is quite inaccurate. In a real greenhouse, outside and inside air are prevented from mixing. Obviously, that's not the case with Earth's atmosphere. But the terms greenhouse effect and greenhouse gases are so common that all but the most innerly retentive scientists just grimace and keep quiet. And most don't even think about it at all. The greenhouse effect is fundamental to understanding Earth's climate system. So let's look at it in a couple of ways. First, the verbal way. Insulation is absorbed by Earth. Next, Earth emits infrared radiation. Greenhouse gas molecules absorb some of Earth's infrared radiation. Greenhouse gas molecules emit infrared radiation in all directions. Some continues out into space, but Earth absorbs downward directed infrared from greenhouse gases. This raises the temperature of Earth's troposphere. Now let's use a flow chart like concept map. If this is too busy for you, don't worry about it. It's the same stuff as in the simple, simpler list on the preceding slide. The sun emits solar radiation, chiefly infrared and visible light with a little UV. The radiation reaches and energizes Earth, which then radiates infrared radiation of its own. This infrared is selectively absorbed by greenhouse gas, such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and methane which subsequently have more kinetic energy, which causes more collisions of gas molecules in the temperature, which causes an increase in the temperature of the atmosphere. Let's keep track of the possible destinations for insulation using both a flow chart at the top and this cartoon cross section at the bottom. Imagine that over some period of time, 100 units of solar radiation arrive at Earth. About 51 of these units, 51%, will be absorbed at Earth's surface. About 19 units will be absorbed by the atmosphere and the clouds. And 30 units will be reflected back into space by Earth's surface, clouds, gas molecules, and dust particles called aerosols in the atmosphere. So note the balance. It's 100 units in, 100 units out, 51 plus 19 plus 30. We'll talk more about this key energy balance in episode eight. Note the word albedo in purple text near the top of the diagram. I mentioned it in episode four and defined it as the reflectivity of a surface. Well, technically, albedo is the reflected radiation divided by the incoming radiation. Often it's expressed as a percentage. The higher the albedo, the more insulation is reflected away. The lower the albedo, the more insulation is absorbed. As you can see, the albedo of different components of the Earth system varies from less than 0.1, or 10%, to over 0.9, or 90%. Averaged over its entire surface, the Earth has an albedo currently is about 0.3, or 30%. Earth's albedo is not constant. It may rise or fall in response to natural changes, 
picture the melting of land-based ice, or in response to human actions, such as cutting down forests to plant more agricultural fields. In later episodes, we'll visit ways in which nature and humans have changed Earth's albedo. And that's the end of Episode 7.